In darkness we can do nothing. But Psalm 36, 9 says, In His light we see the light. Let's lift our hands together and just declare with me. Father, thank You that the power of light has the power to drive out any darkness. And Lord, I want to live in the power of Your light. For Your light is creative light. Your life redeems us. Your light sets us free. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a praise offering. Thank you.
needed rescue, my sin was heavy But chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Clean hands, pure hearts, 
who prays with God. His name is Jesus.
asked me how many times should I forgive and I told him 70 times 7 there will always be times in your life where darkness wants to impact and encroach on your life but there's an altar the arms of your father is open wide 70 times 7 means you have the ability to forgive others and yourself you see if you don't understand forgiveness then you'll reason so many times Peter with the law as a background reasoned Lord if I forgive so many times seven Lord it's the number of perfection no Peter 70 times seven just close your eyes as the word is ministered tonight you will be challenged. The word is, how do I break out of the power of darkness? And in areas of our lives, we need to break out of that power. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just stand for a moment. Anika has a word, I think. Hi, good evening. It was just as when in our preparation as a band and we were praying that I just saw a picture of a peacock, but it was actually up in the sky and it was upside down. And then it came down and was on earth and it was had this massive tail that you looked at. And it, I couldn't even, if I looked up and down, I couldn't see the end of the tail. It was just absolutely beautiful. And I asked God, why am I seeing this and why is he showing this? And he said to me, every single tail feather is one of us and it's, it's just the beauty of God that we're reflecting, and it's just absolutely stunning. And then I saw this, this peacock lowering its tail, just like when they, they lower it and they walk around. And I see it lowering over South Africa. And I just felt that God said, every single one of us, it doesn't matter what you're going through and how dark space you are and what good space you are, every single one of us carries something from heaven. We carry something beautiful. We carry love, we carry kindness, we carry forgiveness, just like um, Neville just said. And that's something that we should cover South Africa with. We should bring that covering, and, but we should always tap from the source, not be a feather that's fallen away, and always tap from God. And I feel that's why I saw this peacock coming down, that it's obviously in courtship that these feathers stand up, and it's, it's in that time, um, that intimate time with God that we have that we get that beauty from and we can release it in South Africa and every single one of us carries that piece of heaven so I want just to challenge us all tonight and myself that in this week coming we should look for those situations where we can be kind and we can be loving and we can be forgiving and we can really just carry the fruit of the spirit um, into into our country and I actually uh, got this scripture that just confirmed it for me and it's Psalm 90, verse 17, that says, Let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. And another translation says, May the favor of the Lord of God rest on us and establish the work of our hands for us. 
the Lord has called to him a peculiar people. You colorful. Some of you are more peculiar than the others. I don't want you to go to somebody and say, you're really peculiar. Because you might be more peculiar than them. Let's lift our hands and declare with me together. Father, thank you. I have a role to play. And Lord, my colorful personality, who you made me to be, can impact people around me. We can, come, we can uh, add to the beauty of our beautiful nation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now take a moment and greet the peculiar people around you. And we're going to ask Marnus to just come and stand here with the team. Karina, if you will come up as well. It's interesting how the Lord works. We want to send Marnus and his wife Karina out tonight. Um, they're going to Cape Town. And uh, she's a qualified duomini. They had a congregation before. And then God brought them here. And God began to bring a renewal in their lives. Now they're going down to Cape Town, and I don't know where, but they sense that God wants to launch them in ministry. So um, I'm going to ask the team just to stand around them. You see, there's a time, and um, a time where she's prepared for something, but where you have children. And then you sort of stand back, but then the season comes where the Lord says, the call on your life is now being activated again. So uh, as we send them out, I want you all to stand. We can extend our hands to them. Thank you, Father. Lord, thank you that we can bless husband and wife. Lord, we can bless their little children. Thank you, Father. Thank you. I just sense the Lord saying, you're not running away from anything. You're running towards what I've got for you. I open doors, doors that men cannot open. But when I open that door and you walk through that door, I walk with you because I'm the good shepherd. And in the right season, you look at one another and say, it's now. And you'll step out. And as you step out, you've been prepared for this new season of your life. I want you just to extend your hands and we're going to pray. Lord, we send them. To fulfill the call you have on their lives. You have a mandate for them. And Lord, they will fulfill it to the glory of God. And your grace will carry them. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may take your seat. We can honor the Lord with that which is entrusted to us. And I just want to share with you a, a short introduction. We have the widow of Zeropath. The prophet Eli Elijah prophesied drought. Imagine you were the prophet. You prophesied drought. And the Lord told you to wait at the brook Cherith. And there the ravens would feed you. It's different that a raven would feed you because it's a scavenger bird. And the ravens come and feed Elijah. Then the river dries up, and he must have thought to himself, I'm a prophet, but I can't prophesy lest I receive a word from God. And he told me to prophesy drought. Now my own provision has dried up. Lord, what do I do next? And then he senses the Lord say, go to Zarephath, go to a widow. If he had to reason, Lord, can't you send me to a wealthy person? Send me to a widow. And off he goes to this widow. And I just want them to put the scriptures on the screen. <clears throat> As he goes and speaks to her, Elijah said to her, do not fear. Because he comes and asks her for a little bit of water. And asks her for something to eat. And go and do as you have said. But make me a small cake from it first. All you got is a little bit of oil a little bit of flour, 
He says in me first. And the first time when I read that, I said, Lord, that, that's selfish. But is that selfish? The prophet, the word of God, must always bring you back to the foundation of applying the word of God. And the word of God is put him first, Matthew 6, 33. He says, and bring it to me, and afterward, go and make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. Now, this is a challenge. It's a challenge to me and to you. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, that's what I want you to give, you say, Lord, you can't do this to me. He says, I've got a shadow in the Old Testament when she was obedient. And the little clip they made of this is she goes and makes, get, gathers sticks and makes this little piece of bread and then gives it to her son and he gives it to the prophet. They were both hungry. We're going to be their last meal. She gives it to the prophet. And then she takes the jar and as she pours it, the oil comes out. The flour comes out. Now, I've shared before, I was at Kwasi Sabantu when food multiplication took place. Kwasi Sabantu in Zululand, Mapumulu. And I'm standing there watching. They've got bowls of food. they prepared for a 1,000 people. 3,000 pitch up for the meal, lunchtime. And I'm wondering where they're going to get the food. And I'm standing and watching, and they dish up and dish up all 1,000 people next thousand, the next thousand, and the food remains the same. The bowl doesn't get empty. And for the first time, understood, I'd think, God, make a big heap of food. No. You see, when she poured out the oil, there was always oil. When she put her hand in the jar, there was always flour. And there's a concept of put God first, then there will be oil, speaking of the anointing that will break the yoke. Then there will be food, bread to eat. Because he who gives seed to the sower gives also bread to eat. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we can receive this offering. And thank you, Lord, that people are obedient to what you tell them to do. And Lord, when they get home and they think of paying in online, they will not reason. They will say, Lord, your word taught me. And I can act accordingly, and then you will be Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're visiting with us tonight, you can just raise your hands when the deacons come. And then at the desk, we want to give you a little visitor's package. Is there anybody that's here for the first time? You haven't been here before? Um, by, welcome. We trust that you'll enjoy the service with us. And let's just listen to the announcements. The, uh, the deacons can take up the offering. Good evening. Just some announcements. Uh, next week, Sunday morning, both morning services, we have got the privilege again to have guest speaker Dr. Anthony Jacobs with us. It's always a blessing to have him. I want to encourage you, come and listen to him. You will be blessed. Invite friends and family. Um, and then on the Friday evening, just after that, on the 22nd, at 7 o'clock on Friday evening, we have got an encounter service again. If there's areas in your life that you feel that you really need breakthrough for um, and you just can't get through, I want to invite you to come to that service. It's always the testimonies that comes from that is really amazing. People really getting breakthrough, so you're so welcome. Then that Sunday evening on the 24th, we have got again our healing and prophetic service. God wants to speak. God wants to speak to you. He's got a prophetic word over you. He's got an appointment with you. If, there is, if there's healing that you are just battling to get that healing, I want to invite you. Come with an expectation to that evening. Come with an open heart. Bring friends. Bring family. Bring the neighbors. And then volunteers. Volunteers is always such a thing is, this is our spiritual house. And as spiritual children in a spiritual house, being part of a family, 
We need to serve. And I want to invite you to become part of this family on some level. There are so many areas that we need people to come and serve. Just come and serve. Be part of the family. Buy into the vision that we have. Then uh, on the 1st of December, we have our Christmas carol service. Yes! <laughs> and it is again promising to be an amazing evening. All right, so dress up nicely. There's going to be a photo booth outside. It's going to be a festive, opening the festive season. It's the 1st of December. So invite everybody that you know, a colleague from work, come and come and enjoy it. But that's not the end. It's going to be a feast. Afterwards, come and have a feast meal with your friends, with your family, with your spiritual family. You can make reservations at the reception desk, or you can just phone the information during the week, or just uh, email info at levendevoort.co.za. Book your space, book your table. Come and enjoy. It's 120 rand per person, and Jock promises that it will be unforgettable. Thank you, Hazel. While waiting on the Lord, I sense to share with you, and the service is going to be a bit different tonight as we draw the service to a close, but I want to share with you a breaking out of the power of darkness. Darkness has no power, or let's say darkness has a power because it can hide things. You can hide something in the dark. So darkness will always represent an uncertainty, there'll be a degree of fear, and there'll be a lack of peace, because darkness is controlling. And uh, that which is hidden can be exposed by the light. Somebody said to me one day, if the sun had to come up in the middle of the night, many people will be exposed. Now in Exodus 10, 21, we read about one of the plagues, the ninth plague, and it was darkness. I always wondered why that would be a plague. Turning water to blood, I understand. But it says in verse 21, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness that might even be felt. You can nearly feel the darkness. I don't know if you've been in a dark place. You feel the darkness. Then the thick darkness came over the land of Egypt and over the people. They could not see one another for three days. Nothing. Now we may ask, why darkness as a plague? Lord, why darkness as a plague? Then there are two things. First, God demonstrated his power over the sun, which was the most potent religious symbol of Egypt. Every Egyptian god had to bow to the true god of light. So he closed the sun up. James 1.17 says, Every good and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Satan is called the prince of darkness. God says, when I'm in front of you, on the side of you, or behind you, I'm always light. There's no darkness in God at all. This challenges us in a certain area. Secondly, because darkness was an attack on Pharaoh himself. Since he was considered to be the incarnation of Amun-Ra, the sun god. I want to show you three pictures of the sun god. You see, and he was the reincarnation of the sun god. That he could give light. And now the sun god was stripped of all power. He was called the god of the sun. Isis is the daughter of Amun-Ra. I just wondered where the Isis came from as I was preparing. And then the third picture of this god. This god that was supposed to bring light. So Pharaoh, who considered himself to be the sun god, was put to shame before all the Egyptians, where's your power? You can't bring back the light. We can't even see our hands in front of us. In Goshen, 
the Jews were living in a place in Egypt called Goshen, it was light. There was light in their homes. Just in Egypt, it was dark. It was like you'd come out of the light and it's pitch dark. And it must have been interesting. The God that the Egyptians serve, they say their Pharaoh can bring light. But the Jews, we don't believe in their God, but there's light. Darkness is the absence of light. So when you try and live in darkness, it actually means God keep out of this part of my life. Lord, I'll bring all this to the light, but no, not here, Lord. Lord, I've committed my life to you. Come in to the lounge of my life. But Lord, the attic and the basement, you don't go there. That's what we do in the secret. That's what we do in the dark. When I start walking with the Lord, I've got to come out of that power of darkness. Where there is a light that I can see. That's why he says there's a natural light. But in Psalm 36, 9, he says, in his light, we see the light. There's a light that shines from God. And it's like people's eyes go open. And all of a sudden, they see the beauty in front of us and around us. Physically, we see the beauty. All the beauty. If, imagine all the beautiful colors and flowers. You wouldn't be able to see that. See that. And then, because of darkness, we can't see the danger. You can't see that there's danger here. I can't go there. I can't move there. Over there, because there's darkness... I can fall into a hole. I can fall off a building because I can't see. We must have light. You and I need light. We must have light to see. Now, God created us that way, that we need light to see. Then God comes and he keeps light on the earth as part of his created order. There's a time to sleep, but there's a moon. There's stars. Then there's daytime, and it's light. Now, 1 John 1, 7 in the Amplified Bible opens up something beautiful. But if we really, really are living and walking in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have true unbroken fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us or removes from us all sin and guilt keeps us cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestations. When I read this scripture, I've read it over and over. The Holy Spirit said, I want you to understand something. When you walk in the light, because people say, you know, I need the blood to cleanse me. This scripture says, a light walk is a blood walk. Because when you walk in the light, the blood works, it cleanses. But furthermore, not only is a blood walk a light walk, it's even more than that. Because literally it means that I don't have, the enemy doesn't have power over me. The blood walk is a light walk. That means if I'm really living in the power of the blood, and how do I overcome the enemy? By the blood of the lamb, the word of my testimony. So I'm testifying about the blood, but I'm living in darkness. The blood has no power. The blood has power in the light because that's where God is. Darkness is where the enemy is. Darkness is where the lie is. Darkness is where there's confusion. So I need to come to the light and say, Lord, I need to be delivered from this thing. Now, this scripture is really challenging to me because in a light walk, broken fellowship will be healed. God's really dealing with me to go to everybody that feels I've hurt them or has withdrawn from me or from the church because they felt hurt. And he says, unbroken fellowship. Where do you stand? Are there broken relationships in your life? Yes, but you don't understand my father. You don't understand my brother. I can love everybody, but I can't love my sister. I can love everybody but my brother, my father. You don't understand what my father did to me. The main thing is that I go and I go and set a thing right. I go and 
rectify that. I'm sitting with a young girl, and she gets epileptic attacks. Every time when you speak to her, she gets an epileptic attack, falls on the ground, froth comes out of her mouth. And uh, we didn't know what the reason was. And then, as the Lord, I'm busy with her, I said, Lady, I don't understand, but I sense there's a spirit of perversion. Are you living an immoral life? She said, no. I said, but something is in the dark. That's why this thing manifests. She didn't want to tell me. I said, I'm not going to pray for you. You go home. You come back to me. A week later, she phoned me. And when she phoned me, she said, I need to come and see you. She came up from the free state came to see me and said, uh, um, my father raped me. But how can I expose my father? And I spoke to my mother. She didn't believe it. Now what? I said to her, well, the Bible says, honor your father and your mother. Don't honor that which the father did wrong. But you need to bring it to the light. So I said, if you want me to go with you, I'll go with you. She said, Dad, will you take me for a milkshake? She's sitting. She says, Dad, you brought me to the church because I was getting epileptic attacks. Dad, it's your fault. But me and the devil, we don't have an agreement. I'm not here to accuse you, Dad. I'm here to say, Dad, if you really love me, then you'll set this thing right. Dad, I'm here to forgive you. Not in my strength. Because the Lord has touched my heart. The father started crying. And he said, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened to me. Perhaps I had too much to drink. I'm so sorry. Can you find a place in your heart to forgive me? And the daughter said, Dad, I forgive you. She hugged her dad. As she hugged her dad, her head shook. And that spirit left her immediately. As she came to the light... The light exposed that which had held her bondage. She was a Christian. She was serving the Lord, but getting epileptic attacks. Coming forward for ministry, getting epileptic attacks, but didn't open up that part of her life. In light, in a light walk, there's a cleansing because the blood works. It says in Ephesians 4, 26, 27, and 30, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. That means I get cross because of a certain thing. But don't sin. Don't let the sun go down. Before you go to bed, set that right. Because he says in verse 7, 27, Nor give the devil, nor give the devil any place. The moment you give the devil a place is if you go to bed cross. You go to bed mad. You go to bed in because you're really upset you didn't set the thing right. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Not only do you give the devil place, you grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of your redemption. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit. And now you grieve him because he says, you know, this is not the act of God. This is not how God works. He wants you to come to the light. It's interesting I phoned this girl, I can't remember how long after that, and she said, you know, when I truly forgave my father, my father realized he needed deliverance as well. And now I've got my daddy back. We're a wonderful family. We used to sit around the table and you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. Actually, the Lord says, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice, I will come in and sup with you. The Lord wants to fellowship with us. On the other hand, you can give place to the devil by anger. Remember, when anger comes, you'll do two things. You'll explode outward, shout, scream, hit, break something, or you'll implode. Both are dangerous because if you implode, you start building up a thing. And people who implode, then they have to bring some kind of peace. They start drinking or be living adulterous or they start eating, doing something. Some kind of addiction to get away from the reality 
to get peace. They'll do, it's like we'll go to war to have peace. What does it mean, literally, to give the devil a place? I want you to see you've got a house, a lovely place, lovely house. And you got it on the market for a certain price. Somebody comes to buy the house and you say, I'll give it to you for half price on one condition. In the corridor, there's a nail in the wall. That square meter remains mine. Half price. Deal. Sign the contract. And that person says, I've got legal right of that square meter against the wall. No problem. There's only a nail there. After here, the guy comes, he says, how's my square meter doing? He says, oh, well, we hung a picture there. You can't hang a picture there. That's mine. Take off the picture. So they take off the picture. And after another year, he comes along, he says, how's my nail doing? He says, you know, we got so used to it. It's part of the corridor when we walk along. The next year, he comes, and he brings a dead cat, and he hangs it there. You say, you can't hang a dead cat in my corridor. He says, it's my property. Legal right, you signed the document. And that's what the devil does. You give him legal right by one thing, a little nail. And he hangs his dead cats on that. And he comes and destroys your life through one thing. One little thing. Just a little thing. Now, when you get born again, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, therefore, if any person is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. Now, everything is new. Old things have passed away. So people say, what's your problem? Old things have passed away. But because you're a product of the framework of your reference, you've got this thing that you don't want to bring to the light. You're born again, you're saved, you're going to heaven, but you're living, and the enemy has an effect because he's got a nail in your life somewhere holding on to you. Now he says in Ephesians 4, 17 to 25, he goes on, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. So when you're born again, your walk changes. That's why the church was called the walk. In the futility of their mind, the way they were thinking, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, my understanding is darkened. So I'm, I'm at the door, but I'm not enjoying the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Just keep that scripture. In Ephesians 1.18, Paul prays for the church in Ephesus that the eyes of our heart might be flooded with light. The eyes of our heart. Then he goes on. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. You have not so learned Christ. I'm not greedy anymore. I'm not making all I can, canning all I've made, and sitting on the can, it's mine. And the Lord will normally come and test you in that area. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus Christ, that you put off concerning your former conduct. I put it off. The old man who grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. There are lusts that are deceitful. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And you put on the new man. There's a clothing which was created according to God. Literally in true righteousness and holiness. Putting on the new man. Now the context there is. Therefore putting away lying. I, I didn't lie. I just told half of the truth. So I sounded okay. It wasn't really a lie. It was, uh, you know, it was, it was not really a witch. It was a white witch. It was, um, it was, uh, what, what do they, the, you know, it was a, a good witch. 
And you find a good witch. It was not really bad, but it's still a witch. You find a good snake and a bad snake. A snake is a snake, except um, the snakes that don't really have poison. Um, you can see these comic strips. The friendly ghost. There's no friendly ghost. He goes on and he says, therefore putting away lying, let each one speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. We members, so we have to speak truth. The concept there is stop lying. You say, I'm not really lying. No, actually, you're not telling all the truth. Then Ephesians 4.28, let him who stole, steal no longer. And no, I didn't steal. The little boy comes and says, Daddy, you know, I need a pencil. He says, I'll get one from work tomorrow. And then he gets one from work and he reasons they don't pay me properly here anyway. A pencil is nothing. But the concept is stop stealing. And why does he say that? In Luke 16, verse 10 and 11, he was faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He was unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will com commit to you the trust of true riches? I'm really believing God's raising up an army. But the army has to walk in the light. My father was a fighter pilot in the Second World War. They'd go with the Spitfires and attack in formation. If one pulled out, his own men would shoot him down. Because he'd break the formation and put the others to danger. The Lord doesn't want us to break rank. Wait, I want to run into the dark quickly. No, we're going to be people of light. Walking in and the light is going to expel the darkness. The power of God is going to be released because light has creative power because I can see. God tests our faithfulness in order to give us riches. Think of, Jesus, of, of Joseph. His father favored him. That made his brothers jealous. And we have reasons. I mean, why, why, why are you favoring one? Ya Karina and Marnas have two children. I know some children are not as naughty as others. But do we favor the one child? And I hear that from so many. I pray with so many people. I say, I see you with three or five children. And you were the least favored. You always had to do the dirty work. And your brothers and sisters would mock you and say, where, where, where? You've got to do that. And you began to build up a hatred. You can't love them because you hate what your parents did to you. And that's not right. Now think of Joseph. His father was not right. His father gave him a colorful coat. I want you to see the colorful coat he gave him. Uh, perhaps like the peacock. He gave him a colorful coat, and I can imagine Joseph coming and saying, Gee, brothers, I mean, there are 11 of you, but look, my daddy favors me. I can do whatever I want. And then we think God is a respecter of person. Now, his brothers wanted to kill him. One day, his father told him to go and take something, go and see if they were okay. So he goes, and his brothers see him. But before he told them, he said, you know what? I had a dream. I had a dream that the sun and the moon bowed to me and 11 stars. I mean, the brothers, 11 stars. So we going to bow to you. You're our little brother. You must bow to us. And then they said, let's kill him. And Reuben said, no, no, no. Let's throw him in a pit. A pit is like a deep well. Just show the second photo. He's throw him into the pit. I don't know how they threw him in. Then travelers come past. And they say, let's sell him. Imagine your own family wanting to sell you. What was his mistake? He had a dream from God. That one day, God would release him in a position. But it was unwise to share the dream because people didn't understand. Neither did his brothers. So they sold him. And when they sold him, look at the face 
of, if they can just move the next picture, um, he's sold. Now he goes into the house of Potiphar, and he does well. Potiphar is blessed, but Potiphar is a wife. She's frustrated. She's got something dark. While husband is away, she does something in the dark. She comes to him and tries everything to get him to fall. The moment you have a mandate and a call of God on your life, there's a prophetic word for your destiny. Somebody will come along and try and lure you away, depending on the bait. On the, the bait. He runs away, she keeps the cloak. When a husband comes home, who does he believe? You know, the man you hired, he tried to rape me. Hmm. Let's throw him in prison. He lands in prison. He can sit in prison becoming hateful, resentful. But he starts to serve. So the prison warder puts him in charge of everything. And he can look after everything in prison. It's sad. You might feel that you're in a prison of a situation. And learn from Joseph. Just serve. The Bible says in Psalm 105 from verse 17, it speaks of Joseph now. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. In prison, they lock him up until the time that his word came to pass. You might feel that you're in a prison, but there's a word, there's a mandate over your life. The word of the Lord tested him. Why must the word of the Lord test you? Can I use you? Are you worth something? In Italy, you can buy a vase uh, that they make from marble or something from marble. But then sometimes a chip breaks out. So they put wax in there. And then they never know if that is pure. So they test it. Doof. As they'd hit that. And they'd say it's not sincere. Sincere. If you had to be tested, can God trust you? I believe, as I said before, there are people here whom God is raising up who will raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, heal the sick. But can God trust you? Can God trust you with that? Or will there be something that the enemy can hold you back on and eventually destroy you with? He goes on. The king sent and released him from prison because when he was ready, the Lord gave the king a dream. The ruler of the people let him go free. But he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions from the prison to the palace. But more than that, in charge of the whole nation of Egypt. But God had done that. They can just put the next scripture on. He says, he made him lord over the house. And then he says he had to test him. He had to test him. Could he trust him? Could he trust him with that? Now his brothers come because there's drought where all his family is. And now he, he can say, man, I've been waiting for you, my brothers. Now I'm going to get you. I'm going to put you in jail. I'm going to have you beaten up. He doesn't do that. He tells his brothers who he is, and he forgives them. And God uses this, this man who went through all the negative with the family. You might go through negative things with your friends, with your family. What are you going to do about it? Will you pursue peace? Will you run after and say, I'm going to set it right? And tonight, as I'm speaking, you might think of somebody who's done you in, who's harmed you. How do you forgive them? Only from the cross, like this girl. She said, I don't think if I can face my daddy. I said, when you got born again, the line of the tribe of Judah came to live in you. You needn't be somebody who's tread upon. You needn't be ugly, but talk straight to your father. And as she did, the father tried to backpedal first. She said, Dad, I'm not working with the devil. 
not here to accuse you. I'm not here to make a fool of you. That's why I got you without mom. I wanted to settle this between us. I've only got you as my daddy. Don't have any other daddy. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. It says, it's incredible scripture. It says, he has delivered us. He has, past tense, from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. You were in darkness. Darkness has a power over you. Anywhere there's a power over you. And now you've come out into the kingdom of the son of his love. Into the kingdom of the son of his love. I want to tell you a story. A little boy, he gets a pellet gun as a Christmas present. So he's walking around trying to shoot birds. He never hits any bird. He's not good. He comes home and he thinks, you know, he has granny's big peacock. And uh, he takes the gun and he just swings around. And he shoots the peacock through the head, dead. He looks around and takes the peacock and hides it at the back there under the wood. So it's all over. Nothing is there. Comes into the house and... Uh, his sister and he have to make turns to wash the dishes. So it's his sister's turn to wash the dishes. So the sister comes and says, Brother, the other day I saw where you put the peacock. Um, I know it's my turn to wash the dishes, but... So he washes the dishes. After two, three weeks he thinks, I'm just going to wash dishes for the whole of my life. So he goes to his granny. He says, Granny, you know that day I shot your peacock? The granny says, I know. I was looking out of the window. <laughs> then you went and hid the peacock. I took it and stripped it, and that's what you had for supper that night. <laughs> but I want to tell you further. I wondered... How many weeks your brother would make a slave of you because you don't want to walk in the light? Oh, Granny, forgive me. I forgave you when I saw you because I knew that you didn't do that deliberately. And even if you did, I had made a choice to forgive you. How long will you be a slave because of something that's keeping you in the dark? A slave of a situation. Now, I'm going to ask Adele to come up. Adele was dedicated as a baby girl when she was born to be a Satanist, to be a witch. And I'm going to ask her to share with you in about seven, eight minutes, just what, what was the hardest of her in her life to break out in terms of darkness? What did she battle with? Because when you come out of Satanism, that's all she was taught taught to curse, to do whatever the Satanists do. And she's been serving the Lord for a long time, 25 years now. But there were times she battled to break out of things. She's going to finish sharing, and we're going to see a clip of Barabbas when he was set free and Jesus crucified in his place, and then see what happens after that. Thank you, Adele. First and foremost, I want to say that I got reborn or I gave my heart to Jesus in a very powerful moment. So my, my walk with Jesus started um, by experiencing God's manifest presence. So that is the foundation on which I gave my heart to the Lord. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm used to, to walking in the power and the glory of God. And I'm, I, it, it, it doesn't make sense for, to me that any Christian would not walk in the power and the glory of God. So that is the foundation of my salvation. And um, it wasn't an a, a easy journey. I had to go through deliverance. I had to confess my sin. I had to, I had to put myself out there, allow God to do certain works in my life. And, um, 
to, to cut the cords from the enemy, maybe covenants, cancel certain things. Um, but I'm just going to go through a list of a couple of things that I want to share with you. Um, in, in the occult, um, p- people who are raised in the occult are so used to think and believe that Jesus is the enemy. For example, um, as children, they would experience electric uh, surges being put through their bodies every time they heard or they hear the name Jesus. So they, in themselves, um, build up this programming that the moment when I hear Jesus, pain will follow. So I had to to learn that Jesus is not the enemy. So I had to make the decision that he's not the enemy and he's not going to hurt me. But I must tell you that this past 25 years, I can't say that the first five years was just um, terrible and then everything went smoothly because I'm still growing as a Christian and every now and then uh, the Holy Spirit will remind me that I still have to work with maybe my impatience or anger or judgment. So God is always busy with me. So I had to realize that Jesus is not the enemy. I also had to to learn that I don't have to bring sacrifices to be accepted by a God. That Jesus was this sac- this sacrifice, the only sacrifice once and for all. I don't have to depend on myself or be acceptable as a person. None of us can ever make it if we have to make it on our own or try to make it. Because it, if it wasn't for Jesus and the cross, none of us would sit here. So I had to um, also accept that Jesus was the final sacrifice. I feared the presence of God. Two things happen when you're involved in Satanism. Number one, you want to run away from the presence of God, but somehow something is pulling you in all the time. But I was so much afraid. I remember, I can tell you a lot of stories, but this one friend of mine who who really looks like a Satanist, I used to say that with her looks and my testimony, we will, you know, go far in life. And... um, but she was the one who introduced me to the manifest presence of God. And once I experienced that, I got addicted to the presence of God. And then, um, so I had to get over that, and now I'm comfortable with the presence of God. I had to get over the intimidation of the enemy. I ran away, or I tried to run away from the enemy. But then there was a time that I had to make a decision, am I going to continue running, or am I going to turn around and face my fears. And that is the answer for us to face our fears. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Other translation says God has not given us a spirit that can be intimidated. And I, I, I wanted to rise up like a warrior and not to run away. I'm not a coward. God has not given me a spirit that can be intimidated, but of love, power, and a sound mind. And um, the next one is I had to forgive other people for what they have done to me, but I also had to forgive myself for the things that I have done. And I've said this earlier, one of the things that I regret most is that I, um, that I broke down the name of Jesus Christ, that I turned my heart against him. So of everything that I, that I have done in Satanism, that was the thing I regretted the most. And I had to forgive myself for the decisions that I've made, the things that I've done. I had to also renew my mind according to the word of God. God is greater than I could ever imagine. And, um, and the darkness, the perception that I had about darkness was so small in comparison to the awesomeness and the greatness of God. So God is bigger than anything else. I had to fight the devil's accusations and his condemnation. The difference between God's voice and the devil's voice is that the devil condemns, but the Holy Spirit convicts. And I had to, 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 to know the difference. I had to learn to discern. I had to fight the bad voices. But I also learned to walk in transparency. And I think maybe that's one of the things that people have against me is that I'm so completely transparent when it comes to my own life. I would rather end up um, on the front paper of the newspaper than, than hide my sin, because then the enemy can have a foothold in my life. I love this one phrase. It says, the blood of Jesus will never cover that which should be uncovered. And that's what Uncle Neville spoke about. He said that that when we walk in light, the blood of Jesus can work. 
And um, then I had to learn to love myself and my body and accept it that I was created in the image of God. So I'm a reflection of him. Then also, God is a good father who wants the best for me, and I must be still because he's God. He's the great I am, and he will fight my battles. Another thing that I had to learn is that I had to guard my heart. It's easy for us to be tempted, and when we maybe you're broken, maybe stuff happened in your life, and your heart is not guarded. Now, there's a difference between guarding your heart and hardening your heart. We have to guard our hearts, allow, allow the Holy Spirit to speak into our spirits so that we can be witnesses to what He wants to do in our lives. We are the only Bible that most people will ever read. You do not have to be a Satanist to worship Satan. There's only two realms, God's side and the devil's side. You have to pick one. So you can either walk in darkness or you can walk in light. It takes a lot of courage and discipline to walk in light, but the rewards are endless. It's, it's interesting how... Um, maybe, I know we spoke about ISIS, how those people are willing to lay down their lives and take a lot of people with them where we have Jesus Christ to lay down his life for us. But then I am also willing to lay down my life for my Savior, for my Creator. And I have not only had experiences in, in the occult world or the dark world, but I also had experiences and still have experiences about Jesus Christ and how how amazing it is. There's this one worship song. It all revolves around your throne. And, and I, when, I, when, I, when I listen to that song, it's like, it's like I can feel how I'm in the presence of God, in his, in his manifest presence, in front of his throne, everything that revolves around him and my life revolves around him. It's so amazing how when you surrender your life to Christ and you walk in his fullness, how he can minister in you and through you. And he wants to do that and he can do it to everyone and for everyone. If he can release me and set me free and use me, he can do it for anyone. The, I don't believe that we get small testimonies and large testimonies. It's like, you know, being a small Christian and a big Christian. I, to me, it's, it's all about size, you know. <laughs> That's a big Christian and a small. No, it's not like that. You, <laughs> I know that's not what they mean, but you, like, I believe that even with him, Neville, if he stands next to me, God looks at both of us as his son and his daughter not more spiritual and less spiritual. More, he just looks at us as children of the Most High God. And that's why we also don't believe in titles in this church. We honor people for who they are. And you know, coming from Satanism, and this weekend was a wild one because I had uh, sit through a course about the occult and, and the victory that we can give to other people in the name of Jesus. And I just realized again, the love that Jesus has for us. No other God is persecuted in the way that Christianity and Jesus is persecuted by the satanic church or the occult world. They don't fight Islam. They don't fight Buddhism. They don't fight any other religion except Christianity. It's like these guys have an obsession to come against the light. And, and I'm, I always wonder, what are they thinking, you know? What's wrong with them? Don't they realize? Can't they see? But this is the thing. No, they, they can't. Because they have not had that revelation yet. And maybe this is, I can use this as a challenge tonight. It's not on my notes. But I want to say this, that if you've been serving the Lord for five years or maybe two years, I can bring it down to one year, and you are still sitting here and you are in your comfort zone, God didn't save you for you. He saved you for someone else. He saved you so that he can reach a world out there who still need Jesus. And if you don't bring people into the kingdom of the Lord, something's wrong with you. We are all called to be witnesses out there 
into the world. It's not just me who have a testimony. Each one of you can be used by God. Do not wait until you are perfect. What I said to God when I wanted to forgive people, I didn't know how. There's no 10 steps about, you know, forgiveness. It, I don't know how to forgive. But I said to God, I'm willing to forgive. Help me. I don't know how, but I want to. And just my willing heart was the, the catalyst for him to work and to do. And one day I woke up and I began praying for my enemies. And trust me, it wasn't from my heart. I really didn't want to pray for them. But when I prayed for them, I realized that I have forgiven them. And now God can use me even in their lives. And that's also a miracle. Do I still have contact with some of the people that's in the movement? Yes, I do. They know I'm a Christian. I'm not afraid to say that. But that's an entire mission field where I'm involved. But maybe you can minister to the people that, that you see on a daily basis. You can prophesy life to the person at work. Think of the person in your family or at work that you like the least. God has called you for that person. Now that changes the ball game. <laughs> but I have learned not to be intimidated by the voices of darkness. The enemy will say to you that you can't do it. And you know, the enemy wants to blackmail us. He usually say things like, I know what you did last summer. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and when I do deliverance, and the enemy says something like, yeah, I know what you did last week, you know? You still have forgiveness in your heart. Or, uh, sorry, unforgiveness in your heart. Then the, the thing that I do is I stop, and I confess, and I go on. Because the moment I confess, God is gracious and full of mercy. He forgives me immediately. The blood of Jesus covers me, and I continue. And usually the demons hate that. They, doesn't want, they don't want you to, 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 to just be transparent, release it, let it go. They want you to stay in bondage. And, and, and I was thinking about what should I say tonight because this is a, it's a, you know, I'm coming from Satanism. What are the 10 things that I had to overcome? I'm a human being. Just, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm normal. I'm a, I'm a person with weaknesses and, and issues, a lot of them. And, but this is so relevant. We all get accused by the enemy. We all are being tempted to gossip maybe or to do funny things. Um, but we all fight the same spiritual battle. But we have a God. We have Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit who equip us to do whatever he has called us to do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength, who gives me the power. We are all called to be warriors in his kingdom. Not warriors like you worry too much. Because some of you are called, you think you are called to be a warrior. Don't do that. Fight the good fight of faith. We walk in that. It's a mentality. And even with the, with the armor of God, it's a mentality that I walk in. I am saved. I am the righteousness of Christ. I, am, I have a shield of faith. I walk in faith. I walk by faith. The belt of truth, I carry it with pride and power. It's because it's not a belt, it's the person. Jesus Christ, I'm in him and he's in me. So it's like this thing. And as you grow spiritual and become more mature, things started changing. We speak life in our environments, in our situations. God wants to use you when he can. I'm normal. You're normal. We fight the same battles. You also had to forgive yourself. Maybe today there are some of you who sit here and you have to forgive yourself. Let it go. It's not worth it. Unforgiveness is when you bring bondage over yourself. You, you sit with the keys to unlock that prison that keeps you there. It's time to let it go. God wants to do amazing things, I believe, also in the church. I don't know where, where Neville is. This is awkward. <laughs> This is where I'm not allowed to tell a joke. <laughs> um, I'm just thinking of Peter. You know, when, when he saw Jesus, when he got out of the boat, Jesus 
you know, he walked on water. And I believe that Peter did not walk on water, he walked on the word. Because Jesus said to him, come. And that takes a measure of faith. So we have to, to move forward in our faith and our courage and our boldness and our fearlessness. The enemy loves to intimidate people with fear, you know, fear of darkness, fear of are you going to make the budget, are you going to lose your job, whatever. No, I will not fear because greater is he who's in me than he who's in the world. So no more fear. I'm not intimidated anymore. If I was God, not that I am, then the devil will be like a very small ant standing next to me. And God can squash him with one movement of his foot. And for some reason, he keeps on intimidating us. Maybe it's time that we lift up our heads. The Bible says that God is the lifter of our heads. He also say, there's a passage that says, God will give you a double portion of honor for your shame. And that is what I am walking in, is that double portion of honor. Because right now, I'm in right standing with God. And I know who I am through Jesus Christ, who set me free. Amen. Where are my men? Thank you. I've been released. I'm Barabbas. They let him die in my place. Him, the holy man. But me, the criminal, the murderer. Where are my men? I need to tell you what happened. I stood before this crowd. They kept calling my name. They wanted to set me free, me the guilty one, me guilty of murder, of leading a revolt, but they wanted to set me free. I had to watch when the governor said that they would hit him, strike him with a cat of nine tails. I watched as they took the whip and ripped open his back. I saw blood and flesh flying, even blood that came upon me. 39 stripes in my place. Nothing has ever challenged me, but when the man died in my place, it challenged me. I followed the crowd to Calvary. I watched as they took the nail and they hit it into his feet, knocking his two feet together. I felt the nail going through my feet. Then they took the hand and the other hand and they nailed him. They picked up the cross and dropped it in a hole. And I saw the flesh tear. And I'm thinking, me, Barabbas, that man is dying in my place. You men, you've got to understand. I want you to listen to me when I talk. He died in my place. I stood there. At 12 o'clock, it went dark. It was as if for a moment I knew that he who created light was dying in my place. And then at the end, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I could never forgive. Me, the murderer, how do I receive forgiveness? I can still feel the nails in my hands. As I looked up, he said, Father, into thy hands 
I can meet my spirit. All of a sudden, the darkness broke and there was light. I want to say to all my men, this sinner has met the Savior. This sinner has met the one who died in his place. And I will follow in his footsteps. That's the least I can do for the man who died in my place. Let's stand together. If the worship team will come. I want you just to close your eyes. He died in your place. In my place. His beard was ripped out in your place. In my place. He loved me with a never ending love. He loved you with a never ending love. And all he wants you to do is to follow him. And if you follow him, he will make you fishes of men. For like the life of Barabbas, the life of a criminal could be turned around. He did not come for the righteous. He came for the sinner. He did not come for the worthy. He came for the unworthy. He came and he died in your place, in my place. Let's just be in the presence of the Lord for a moment. Everything else can wait I've come to see your face So everything else can wait I'm here for you I want to Just be here on my feet, just be here on my knees. Here in your presence, I am complete, Jesus. You're all.
When your life is challenged by the love sacrifice of the Son of God, then there's a response that is needed. I want to bring you out of the power of darkness. I don't want darkness to control any part of your life. And if tonight the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you, you want to come for prayer, or you want to go home and say, Lord, I need to pursue certain relationships. Because if I pursue that, the blood will cleanse me. Thank you, Father. Let's keep quiet just for a moment. After tonight, the Spirit of the Lord will bring images back to you. I was asked to speak at an army barracks to 300 men that were in prison. I said, God, I can't preach to them. They've had too many people preach. And the Holy Spirit said, do what you did tonight. I had 300 men on their knees weeping. I commit you to the love of God and to the word of His grace that will build you up, give you a full inheritance with all the saints in light. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Let's just be in the presence of the Lord for a moment. The presence of the Lord is tangible. When you make a decision tonight, you'll find that things fall off of you. That the power of the enemy will be broken over you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here tonight. And the Lord bless you. If you need ministry, just come to the front. If you need to go home and set things right, by a decision, you do that. The Lord bless you. There's nothing I want